Alison, stay with the king! Forever upholding the kingdom, the family, the law. Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This will be my full House of the Dragon episode 7 video. There were a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, I'll be doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get them. And careful for spoilers from the episode if you haven't seen it yet. We'll just start at the beginning and work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments as we go along. Starting with the title of the episode, Driftmark. It's a reference to the island Driftmark, obviously. This is the seat of House Valerian, where High Tide Castle is. Corliss Valerian rules this house from. There's a lot of talk of who it's going to pass to because of all the different people getting remarried, because of all the deaths during the episode, and the question of people's births and legitimacy. And if it wasn't clear, by the end of the episode, they don't answer that question. Like in the trailer for next week's episode, there's still talk of who's going to inherit Driftmark. So that'll be going on in the background, in addition to all the main A story, Dance of the Dragons, Blacks vs. Green stuff. This was also the first episode where someone literally actually referred to them as the Greens, but no one's actually referred to Rhaenyra's side as the Blacks yet though, but she was wearing black for the first time in this episode. So like they're wearing their trademark colors in this big fight. The only minor change that I detected in the intro scene here of the ancient Valyrian freehold with all the blood flowing from the different symbols is the addition of baby Joffrey to Rhaenyra's symbol, but I think they'll change it again in episode 8 to symbolize Rhaenyra and Daemon's remarriage to each other. And eventually they will start having children of their own too. There were references to that during the episode, like she talked about not being able to conceive with Laner right before they got it on. She also talked about fighting fire with fire at the end of the episode, and the whole idea is the more dragon riders, the more dragon seeds you have, the more kids you give birth to, the more dragons you potentially control. So just because there are a lot of kids flying around in the show right now doesn't mean this is the end. There will be more kids in the future. The actual opening scene is of Lena's burial ceremony. It's a burial at sea, per the customs of the Valerian family. The speech is being given by her uncle, Corliss Valerian's younger brother. And during his speech, because of the history of their family and their ties with the sea, a lot of it is very sea, very ship-themed. He references the Merlin King, that's the god of the sea, most commonly associated with the Narrow Sea, where they are. He's mentioned in Feast for Crows and a bunch of the other Song of Ice and Fire novels. They call her passage to death her final voyage, as in the Nine Voyages of Corliss Valerian. That's where all the special trinkets all around his throne room come from. There was a spin-off show that they were developing for Corliss Valerian, so they might actually tell the stories of how he went on all those Nine Voyages eventually at some point. They show you Otto Hightower, who's returned because he's since been named Hand of the King again and returned to King's Landing. When Lena's uncle says that she and her family, her children, will always be bound in blood, that's also a metaphor for the Targaryen family and their Valyrian blood, as well as foreshadowing for the end of the episode where Daemon and Rhaenyra perform their marriage using ancient Valyrian customs of binding their blood together. They show you a wide shot of the High Tide Castle from a different view, and they have five dragons that we know of here. There might be more dragons in the background too. But there's Caraxes, Daemon's dragon, there's Cyrax, Rhaenyra's dragon, Sea Smoke, Laner's dragon, I think Melee's is meant to be there, his mother Rainey's dragon, and Vagar, obviously, Lena's former dragon, because Vagar, obviously, very important to the episode. Now, when Team Green leaves at the end of the episode, they have three dragons with them, including Vagar. I'll address that in a second, because I think they might have had Sunfire, Aegon's dragon, also there, and they might have also had Helena's dragon, who's Dreamfire. That was the same dragon that almost wound up killing Aemon. We get Helena Targaryen's latest dragon dream. She says, Hand turns loom, spool of green, spool of black, dragons of flesh, weaving dragons of thread. That's meant to be a prophecy about the actual Dance of the Dragons, like the actual Targaryen Civil War. The two different sides, the blacks and the greens, actually going at each other. Also, while she's repeating her dragon dream, that little spider's crawling all over her hand, that's meant to be a reference to Laris Strong, who's kind of like a Varys, little finger type of person in this situation. At the end of the episode, he also says, ah, oh, if you should ever need anything, I'd be happy to go get an eye for an eye. And she's like, oh no, I don't need you right now, but I will definitely need you in the future. They have a couple funny moments with Aegon II here. When he jokes about marrying Helena, that's ironic because Alicent has already betrothed the two of them and they will eventually get married and have children. Like, he's already supposed to get married to her. Him eyeballing the servant girls trying to go after them and getting low-key drunk through the entire funeral is also right out of the books. He loved to drink, that only got worse as he got older, and he also loved to get it on with the servant girls. Also, another really funny, ironic moment here is when Aegon is talking about fancying legs, so to speak, when he's talking about Helena. It's also a reference to Helena's other dragon dream from last week's episode when she says the last ring has no legs, which is a dragon dream about Aegon II's future. No spoilers there, but it definitely has something to do with legs. I don't think they're actually going to pay that dragon dream off till much, much later. Like, she had a dragon dream about Aemon, he'll have to lose one eye, and they paid that off in this episode. The other one about Aegon, they probably won't pay off till next season. 
We get a couple scenes with Jacaris and Lucerus and Bela and Reyna. They're actually pretty good friends. They just want to show you the vibe between Damon's children and Rhaenyra's children. And it's generally pretty good. Like, they're on pretty good terms. Corliss Valerian talking to Lucerus about inheriting Driftmark someday is obviously a reference to everything that goes on during the episode with Laner faking his death, and then the question of who's going to inherit Driftmark, because the whole idea of who has the greatest right, like Rhaenyra's children, who everybody knows are bastards, or is it going to be someone within the Valerian family? And that's just one of those plot lines that'll take a couple more episodes, maybe even into season two, to resolve. The scene between Rhaenys and Rhaenyra is just meant to show you that Rhaenys definitely knows what's really up, like she understands and she kind of goes along with it because she loves her son and she understands his true nature. So she's just kind of forced to go along with it low-key, which she talks about to Corliss later in the episode, like, look, we're alone together, we can admit the truth to each other. It's also why she wants Corliss to name Lena's daughters as the heirs to Driftmark, because they are of pure Valerian blood. Laner seems like he's so sad he's just gonna walk out into the middle of the sea. When Rhaenyra says that he's grown so despondent that he's basically going to become useless in their marriage, what she's mostly worried about, even though she does kind of care about Laner, is that he'll eventually grow so careless that their secret really will be found out and it'll just cause way more problems later on. All the weird energy between Rhaenyra and Daemon early in the episode is just meant to foreshadow the chemistry that they've always had going back to the first episode, like it's always kind of had that weird thing going on between them, that weird energy together, until they actually do get together later in the episode and then officially get married. Viserys and Daemon remark on the past 10 years between them, all the drama that's happened, how the gods have been cruel to both of them. The whole thing with Daemon not wanting to come back to King's Landing immediately, like rejoin court immediately, is because, yeah, he's a little too proud, he's still a little bitter about what happened, but also because he gets remarried to Rhaenyra, and Rhaenyra is on Dragonstone, so he goes to Dragonstone instead. Obviously his whole comment to Otto Hightower about leeches growing fatter and always wanting more is just a callback to Viserys' leeches in earlier episodes that they tried to heal his wounds with. And also him understanding that he's trying to influence things for his own cause, for the Greens. Like this is the Game of Thrones and game recognizes game. I know exactly what you're doing. The real short scene of Viserys confusing Alicent for his previous wife, Ama, is also just meant to show you how his mental capacity is diminishing. And also he's hawked up on a lot of milk of the poppy at this point probably. That'll become a bigger thing in future episodes that we'll talk about. That will lead to more dire consequences. Like, imagine if everybody listens to what the king says, and if the king's mental capacity just deteriorates enough, and he says something he doesn't mean to, it could have dire consequences. I also love the scene here of Otto Hightower just kicking Aegon II. Like, he's the future king, but he's still kind of kicking him up. Like, get up, get out of here. Like I said earlier, Aegon really loved to drink when he was younger. That only gets worse. So, like, this will be a bigger thing in future episodes when we see the older version of Aegon II. Then the whole scene between Corliss Valerian and his wife Rhaenys is him just trying to come to terms with the truth of the matter. Like he's so obsessed with the Iron Throne and this idea of justice for his family because of what happened to his wife being denied the Iron Throne back during the Great Council of 101 AC that it just blinds him to the present day truth. She only cares about her family, her granddaughters now, and that's why she's talking to him about passing Driftmark to them. It's also interesting to note that she really doesn't like Damon. She really just cares about her granddaughters, and her granddaughters are Damon's daughters, which means that she's kind of forced to accept Damon. It's just a way to show you that his battle lines are being drawn like Team Green, Team Blacks are starting to form. Not everybody within each faction loved each other. So like all the Blacks supporting Rhaenyra didn't automatically love each other. The same thing with the Greens. We get that scene with Damon and Rhaenyra, and a lot of it is referencing their history together going back to those first couple of episodes when she was younger. Especially when she references him abandoning her. Like, you abandoned me metaphorically and literally. That's a reference to what happened in Flea Bottom, but also eventually later in life when he was banished by Viserys. He didn't have much of a choice. Like, he actually got banished from court, so he couldn't stick around and help her as much as he wanted, probably. And also there's the whole idea that he's also obsessed with the Iron Throne and whether or not he chills on that because it seemed like in last week's episode he'd kind of given that up. Like he didn't want to go back to court. I don't want to deal with all that politicking, all that drama. Let's just forget about it. But it seems like Godfather style, Rhaenyra is the one to bring him back into the family. Like I need your help. We need more Valyrian blood. We need to fight fire with fire. Which like I said is also a reference to fighting dragons with other dragons. And the only people that can do that are dragon seeds, the dragon riders. Really interesting history too, she clarifies a couple details. She said that she and Laner Valerian actually did try to conceive. They consummated the marriage and tried a couple times, but they did not wind up conceiving, which is why I think that when Rhaenyra and Daemon wind up getting it on after this, when she's like, I'm not a child anymore, I think because of the timing of the birth of their first child together, like I said, more children get born in the future, they wind up having more children together. I think because of the timing of the birth of her first child with him, they probably conceived this night on the beach. 
She also mentions the curse of Harrenhal again. I explained that in last week's episode in one of my separate videos. That continues to be a thing throughout history up to the events of the main show later in the timeline. Everyone who becomes the Lord and Lady of Harrenhal dies some tragic and mysterious death. So, as crazy as it seems like Larys Strong is right now influencing things from afar, because he's the Lord of Harrenhal now, he's probably going to wind up dying some crazy death. Then this whole part of the episode that takes place on the beach in the middle of the night, I'm sure people are going to be posting memes about this for a while. Like, this is the darkest that you get in Game of Thrones. You know, crank up the brightness setting as much as possible on this episode to see if you can pick out the details in the background. But obviously the big thing here is Aemon claiming Vagar, and I love the way that he drops the F-bomb right after Daemon and Rhaenyra's love scene elsewhere on the same beach, like right as that's happening, he drops an F-bomb. Very apropos. The reason the netting is covering Vagar is because Lena probably added it, it looks kind of like Fisherman's Knot, so she probably added it so that she could mount Vagar way back when she was younger when she first claimed her. If it wasn't clear, Vagar is a female dragon. The words Aemon keeps speaking to her in High Valyrian are for her to be calm, because she almost roasts him too. When she purrs and he flies on her, even though they treat it in a kind of funny way with him almost falling off and screaming the whole time, that sort of seals the deal, like she is officially his dragon now. When he says Sovays too, that also basically means go, like go Vagar, go! A lot of the scenes of him on the back of the dragon trying to figure it out almost falling off is a good way to show you what their dragon battles will be like during the actual Dance of the Dragons next season. Like it'll be a lot of this in the sky with a bunch of different people fighting each other on Dragonback. You also notice the way she flies is a lot different than the other dragons, so the whole idea is that she's gotten so big and so old that it's way harder for her to, like, just physically take off. But once she is in the sky, she's kind of like a B-52 bomber, so once she gets her claws on you, so to speak, it's done. It's over. The younger, smaller dragons are way faster, way more nimble. You also notice when they're flying, his theme song on Vagar is sort of like a version of Daenerys' theme music combined with the main Game of Thrones theme song. Then they have the whole battle with the girls, Aemond, and the boys. Bela and Reyna come to wake up Jacaris and Lucerys. Daemon and Rhaenyra also kind of take notice of what's going on. And when Aemond walks back in like a boss, like, haha, make fun of me now, I finally have a dragon. No more flying pigs for me. Reyna is the one yelling at him because she's the only one at this point, besides baby Joffrey, who doesn't have a dragon. And she wanted to claim Vagar because it was her mother's dragon. There's no real hard and fast rule about who can claim dragons within the Targaryen family, because up to this point there haven't been that many dragons, that many people to worry about up to the time of Jaehaerys. Jaehaerys had like a ton of kids, but most of them had died off, so it wasn't that big of an issue. Now you have a point where there are many dragon riders on both sides, and everybody wants a dragon, and there's just a couple people left who haven't claimed one yet. Currently now, Reyna is the only one who's not a baby that doesn't have a dragon. That'll change eventually, and we'll have more time jumps, so more kids will be born, and you'll have more dragon riders, more dragons. By the end of the series, we'll be up to like 17 dragons total, but I think we're only going to see 9 total during season 1. They have the whole scene where Aemon winds up losing his eye, paying off Helena's dragon dream, he'll have to lose an eye. And then we have that whole scene of Alicent versus Rhaenyra, with both of them kind of going mom brain in trying to deal with the actual lie about them being bastards and her getting vengeance for Aemon. The way the showrunner said that they're playing this, like with all the different characters, is basically what Aegon explains to Viserys during the episode, like, look at them, we all know the truth. The whole idea is that the entire realm basically knows that they are the strong boys, but because the king, Viserys, has declared that they're not bastards, nobody can say anything otherwise. So there's this weird tension in the realm, like, well, if the king forced us to accept them as legitimate, that means that they're legitimate, but we know that they're bastards. Even though the circumstance is a little bit more contentious on this show with the bastards, so to speak, the strong boys, they actually did legitimize bastards during the events of Game of Thrones. Daenerys legitimized Gendry as a proper Baratheon, and if you remember, Roos Bolton legitimized Ramsay so that he became a Bolton as well. Also, before Robb Stark died, he tried to legitimize Jon Snow, but obviously he died, so then it was kind of forgotten about. And I think the whole idea here with Viserys is that he knows what's actually going on. Like, he understands from all the looks that everyone gives each other and the way they talk about things that Aemon and Aegon both heard the talk about them being bastards from their mother, Alicent, but Viserys is trying to keep the good times rolling, so to speak. Like, he's a peacetime king and he doesn't want the realm to descend into war, so he's willing to bend over backwards as much as he has to to keep the peace. So that's why later in the carriage on the way home, after things get real crazy, he's like, we will speak no more of this. But by the time Alicent goes at Rhaenyra, they've both gone full mom brain. Like, clearly Rhaenyra is overplaying her hand, like, oh, treason, how dare they talk about them as bastards? Everybody knows that they're bastards. 
And obviously, Allison going full mom brain is like, no, 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 we have to take one of their eyes. Like she even tries to get Kristen Cole to go cut out one of Lucerus's eyes. Even though Kristen Cole has become a full on trash bag at this point, he's not that big of a trash bag yet. So he denies her request. At the end of the episode, when Rhaenyra is talking to Damon about the other side being worried of what they might be capable of, that's also a reference to both of the sides, the greens and the blacks, doing way worse things to each other in the future. Like, if you think that what's happened so far is bad, just wait to the crazy stuff that they get up to in the future. Lair is strong, is ready to help out when that comes. Also, when Kristen Cole tells Viserys, the Kingsguard have never had to defend the prince from other princes, that's another reference to the divided allegiances within the family, the blacks versus the greens. When Viserys basically says that he's going to cut the tongue out of anyone who dares question Rhaenyra's sons as bastards anymore, that's just the end of that particular matter, so the only way to solve things now will be for things to escalate. Like, as much as it seems like he's wrapping up that problem, technically it made things worse. She winds up yoinking the Valyrian dagger off of his belt, not really knowing the history of the context behind it, because Viserys has told her a lot of stories about ancient Valyria, his special model. He loves telling stories about his model. He hasn't revealed Aegon's secret to her because she is not the heir. It also means that he hasn't told the secret to Aegon II. I think the reason why Daemon stopped Kristen Cole from stopping the fight is because Daemon wanted to let things play out and Littlefinger style take advantage of the chaos in the future like, oh no no, we want this to play out. When she cuts Rhaenyra, I think that's also on accident, like she's kind of remorseful about that part. But she does come clean with Rhaenyra about why she's been so pissed off at her and anti-Rhaenyra these past 10 years. And it's all because she is like team rules, team status quo. I've done everything that everybody told me to do. I've followed all the rules and you're getting away with everything like nobody cares about it. She talked about creating her own brand new status quo. That's also what Daenerys talked about during the main Game of Thrones series too. I will create a new order. And Allison is all about tradition. Like we've always done things this way. We need to follow the rules that everybody's been following for all this time. And that's the foundation of their division. So the whole idea here is that Alicent doesn't want power because she's greedy or she doesn't want the Iron Throne for herself. She just wants things to continue being the way that they've always been. The other thing that's going on here too is what's happening between the kids, which is like a whole separate thing. The whole idea is that Aemon says, you know what, I lost an eye, that kind of sucks, but I came out on top because I got a dragon. The showrunners have also said that they're trying to explore the generational aspect of these conflicts and the way that the adults pass their beef on to their children. Like the children don't actually hate each other. They just fight the way that normal children fight every once in a while. So the whole idea is that Alice and Rhaenyra kind of low grade poison their children against each other. So like the whole blacks versus the greens wasn't really a thing amongst the children until the adults made it that way. During their conversation, they also want to let you know that Rhaenyra did care about Laner and they want to make Laner seem like a generally good dude. Like he loved their kids. He's willing to give up everything that he wants in order to support her. And she's trying to do him a solid by finding a way out of this, creating a solution that will give them both what they want. Which is why they actually changed the book ending for Laner's character. In the books, the Maesters recorded that he died in an accident. And obviously that's the way they play it during this episode so that the whole realm thinks that he died in an accident when he really actually got away to the east. I'll address that in a second too because there is the question of his dragon sea smoke. Rhaenyra watches Vagar leave the island with Aemon and the other two dragons are probably Sunfire, Aegon's dragon, and Dreamfire, Helena's dragon. Lyra Strong creeps up to Alicent like a spider, obviously referencing the future crazy things that they will get up to in the shadows like, ah, oh, if she'd ever need me, I have a lot of discretion, I'd be happy to get an eye for an eye. And then Rhaenyra basically proposes marriage to Damon and explains the plan to get rid of Laner or help him escape, basically, get rid of the problem of their marriage. Like she says, the sea offers escape. That's basically a reference to him escaping at sea. Love the way that she also starts speaking with him in High Valyrian again, like their special secret language of love. She references Aegon the Conqueror and his sister wives proposing that they get married. And in a lot of cultures, the more powerful person in a relationship will have to be the one to propose. So for instance, like in real life, Queen Elizabeth II had to be the one to propose marriage to King Philip. What a coincidence because Rhaenyra is the heir. She's more powerful politically than Daemon. And she's also trying to convince him to join forces with her. Like we need to fight fire with fire. You control a dragon, a lot of fire. And the way they talked about their relationship in the past, the past 10 years, like both of us have experienced a lot of tragedy, a lot of crap. They both seem like they're happiest together. Like the whole idea that they actually love each other. And I think the other big surprise here at the end of the episode is that the whole idea behind fake killing Laner, like him faking his death, is Rhaenyra's idea. It's not Damon's idea, which you would normally expect of him. His whole speech to Rhaenyra about being a powerful ruler, being feared, but not being a tyrant is a reference to Magor the Cruel. 
And if it wasn't clear from the act that Carl Corey and Laner put on, Laner was very much in on this whole plan. So like he kind of overacted a little bit, like they kind of hammed it up a little bit. We need to put on a show so everybody thinks that we killed each other. And if it wasn't clear, the bodies on the fire were the bodies of the person that Damon killed in the hallway and the other person that was in the hall when they fought. They didn't have DNA records back then, so that's how they were able to get away with this. The other reason why Laner winds up shaving his head is so that he can't be immediately identified. Like, wow, you have white valerian hair. That means that you're probably from one of these two families. There's also the question of what happens to his dragon, Sea Smoke, because he's not dead and he didn't basically get rid of Sea Smoke. So I think Sea Smoke follows him to the east, but he just doesn't ride Sea Smoke for a while to avoid any undue attention. But eventually the idea is that he might return later in the story, like way later in the story. Then Rhaenyra and Daemon bind their blood, metaphorically and literally, in the High Valyrian custom. And the outfits they're wearing look kind of like the dragon handler's outfits because they follow Valyrian customs. These are meant to be Valyrian outfits. It also kind of seems like they're cutting each other with dragon glass. By their powers of twin cest and sister wiving combined. It was a great episode. Obviously, it's only going to get crazier from here. If you spotted any other Easter eggs or references in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. My episode 8 trailer video will post next. Everyone click here for that. I'll update the link as soon as I post it. And click here for my House of the Dragon Aegon's Conquest video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.